Hey guys, so today is a little different episode than what we usually are, have been doing for the 314 Sports Show. Uh, James is with me today. Uh, Brandon said he might be joining a little bit later, but today we are solely talking about the Blues and the uh, the press conference that uh, Doug Armstrong had yesterday. So let's get right into it. James, how you doing today, man? I'm Brandon. I'm doing great, man. How you doing, brother? I'm doing good. It's been a little bit of a long day for me. I had uh, was out at base and had to come home and get some stuff done. But now we are here, ready to talk some yep. blues hockey, and gonna be a, gonna be a good old time. That's right. Let's get it on. So for everybody that doesn't know or didn't see the the press conference yesterday uh doug armstrong and i believe uh drew banister was there as well i think it was afterwards that drew was there for because i didn't see him actually in the press conference but they kind of talked about a little bit of the the year for the blues kind of a year in review for the team uh and just kind of talked uh more or less armstrong kind of had a Q and a session with a lot of the reporters and everything. And there are some things that we kind of already knew and everything. And there's honestly a couple of things that kind of came a little bit of a, a shock to me. And I'm, I'm sure probably a few other people as well. What did you think of the press conference, uh, James? Yeah. You know, it's a, it, for, you know, the best thing about a guy like Doug Armstrong is he, you know, wears his heart on his sleeve and he's not afraid to really tell it like it is. Like he'll tell you if he's proud or if he's not proud. Um, so when you see that, um, that openness, it's kind of a nice refreshing thing. Like he, mm -hmm. he hit the notes. Like I, I agreed with him on a lot of stuff. Um, you know, he said he did think there was improvement. He was proud of the team. Um, he said it was a success in the terms of, their improvement from last year, but he said it also wasn't a success because the goal was to make it in the playoffs and they didn't do it. So. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. They, he said that he was wanting them to be like close to third, I believe uh, in the conference, which I mean, that was, I think before obviously Winnipeg went and re-signed uh, Hellbuck and Shifley, but that is also near nor there. Cause that's a whole different team than what, the blues are. And he only at the time only really knew of what, uh, what he had with the blues. So, I mean, you, the, every other team within the, the, the conference or even the division is, is going to be a question mark up until the start of the season. Uh, but I mean, to see Bennington come out with the, the stellar year that he had, the, uh, come back to term season that we all saw from Pareko and then a lot of the other young guys, how they came into the team and just showed that they wanted to be here was phenomenal. On my, I, I, mm -hmm. at least what I thought of the team, but I mean, there's a lot of people that all thought that like this, this team or this, uh, the way that the, the season went was kind of a, bad season for the blues but i mean in regard i mean you last season you were at a under 500 tort at the end of the season this year we mm -hmm. were we were over 500 and then to have the right. the almost the same team maybe a couple of additions it was it was nice to see that they're still able to do the things that they had done but you had minor to little improvement or additions so it's yeah. more or less what armstrong said at the at the end of the season last year and into the off season was that you know this is going to take a few years and if this is what we got to see from the first year of that retool i i it'll be interesting to see what happens through this off season into the next season right i think uh you know 
I kind of like the idea of calling it a successful failure, really. Like I could, that's all I took that from Apollo 13 folks. It's not my own thing, but um, at the end of the day, like you did, you had an 11 point improvement from last year. You were above 500. You lasted until basically game 80 of pushing for the playoffs. And, you know, and the failure aspects of it is really that, you know, you can, you can, you can dissect a lot of these games down the middle of the road. Even before Berube was fired, or I mean, after Berube was fired, some of these yep. games that they could have won, they should have won, and they didn't win. And that's your difference. I mean, you all you have to do is subtract the same you know, say, losses, and you're in the playoffs. So oh, you're talking sure. microcosm three. Definitely. So it, it just goes to show you, one, um, there's a lot of growth that needs to happen. You know, obviously they're in a retool, but this was a nice improvement. But two, you know, the central division is stacked. Like it's, oh, this yeah. is it's not a very a, strong division. By all means. Yeah. So uh, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know, with with how the division is stacked, you always got to know that if you're wanting to come out and make the playoffs – you're going to have to come out and be a, a, a strong contending team. And you got to yeah. win against all, you got to win against the, the lesser teams uh, that are below you in the standings. And that was one thing that the Blues struggled with this year. I mean, we lost mm-hmm. majority of the games against San Jose. We lost a couple of crucial games against Columbus and uh, maybe one or two against uh, Chicago, which you, I mean, if you take a lot of those losses and make them in the wins, you're talking about a completely different probably timetable right now. And you might be even playing this weekend. Yeah. If you win those games. That's exactly right, Brandon. I mean, it's, it just goes to show you that, you know, you hate to say that every, every game counts from the beginning of the year, but you know, the NHL, every game really does count. Like if, it, the minute you go on a three, four, five game losing streak, your your chances of you know getting to the playoffs is becomes more and more slim. It's it's a tightrope. That's what it is. And you know the Blues had it at points. They showed great flashes, showed a lot of competitiveness. But at the end of the day, they just didn't have enough, I guess, drive to really push push through. Yep. Yeah. They <laughs> the term that we used. Uh, immensely throughout this season and even in the last season too, the Blues were consistently inconsistent, which is a the pretty much a staple for this team for the last two seasons. And it's it, it's not the best thing to be able to say about your team because you want them to be able to be consistent. But it's when you have stretches like they had which was better this year than what it was last year because you didn't have street like bad streaks and then really good streaks and then back to good streaks you had mm-hmm. abundance of wins and maybe had like a, a fair occasion of having like three maybe four losses in a row but then you had it saw a good abundance of wins with every once in a while a loss so it's you're not on mm-hmm. the same track as what you were last season, but you you looked substantially better than what you did last season. This season, yeah. Ironically, they were literally. I th- I thought someone. I thought I read somewhere they're like six points difference from their Stanley Cup uh, winning run in terms of overall points. Yeah, so. Boy. I believe they're at like 87, 87 or 88, somewhere around there in the 19 yeah. season, whenever they made it into the playoff. Yeah. And then this year, I think we we're at what, 89? Yes, I think that sounds about right. I have to look it up, but I think it's relatively close. We were so, at 92 points this season. At the end of the year, 43, 33, and six. So again, 10 games over 500. Like, yeah. You know, 15 years ago, they would have been in the playoffs, being 10 games over. So oh, just, of course. You know, this is the this is the modern NHL now. So yeah. Uh, one other thing that, I mean, that we didn't have last year that we had this year, 
Uh, obviously, Bennington's really good season, but more importantly, a lot of the help from the young guys. Uh, right. Neighbors, his breakout year. I mean, last year I don't, he played maybe a handful of games. This year he had played pretty much every game except for the last handful of games because he got a concussion on the San Jose mm-hmm. game. But And then Bull Duke and Deans uh, come up from – the AHL, those both those guys, I thought were uh, pretty. I thought they surprised me a lot. Uh, I didn't yeah. think that they were going to play to the caliber that they did, and they they showed a lot of grit and that they wanted to wanted to be here on the big team. Yeah, what you know, you, that makes what do you think of their play? Well, I you know I, I tell you what, the youth movement was pretty solid actually, and that and again that starts really with Robert Thomas at the. I know he's not necessarily a youth person, but he is one of the younger guys and he exploded with, you know, 83 points, which is the most since Pavel Dimitra back yep. in the nineties. Um, but again, like Zach Boldu came up and he showed a lot of promise could easily fit into a top nine role. Um, Zach Dean probably, you know, he showed his skill um, not as much time as Boldu had, but you know, that's good things. And that, that gives me a lot of hope because now, you don't have to be so worried about filling in the gaps that Casperi Kapanen will leave and Sammy Blay and Jacob Verana. Like those are guys that you can don't have to worry about because you've got younger guys that have come in and shown that they want to be here. And you got Alexi Torpachenko that had a great year too. Um, it's, it's very, uh, it gives me a lot of confidence in the team that you got young guys that are growing up fast and have meshed into good roles. And I think now, you know, this off season, this team's going to have to look for some improvements on secondary scoring to not just so much put it all on the shoulders of those young guys, but let them grow some more, let them slowly move into those better spots. That way um, in two, three years, when you, we have Jimmy Snowgrood and we have Dalvor Dvorsky moving in, then we're going to have a, you know, we have the makings of a stacked team right there. Yep. Yeah, and I mean, those those guys, when they come in, I mean, this is just going to be like uh, Bull Duke and Dean and neighbors yeah. at, at, the, at some points because he, uh, Dalvor Dvorsky, he's, he's had time over in Sweden. He's had time in the OHL. Uh, I mean, he's going to have a little bit of time in uh, at camp this upcoming off season, and then who's to say that you might see Snugger? Well, actually, no, you won't see Snugger. He's going to be playing at college still. But I mean, at the end of the season, there's always that possibility, depending on how things go. But I mean, if at some point you'll have Snugger, you'll have Theo Lindstein, you'll have some of these other guys that are all uh, top perennial prospects for the Blues, and yeah, it's the future looks bright and uh, it, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, everything with them all kind of falls into place with this team. Right. And, you know, we, here we are talking about those guys. We totally didn't even bother to mention about Joel Hofer. Like what a year this kid True. had. Like he really, he solidified the goaltending. He gave Bennington not necessarily a run for his money for the starter spot, but they complimented each other so well. That, and you know, and it also showed with the team. The team had confidence in not only Benetton but in Hofer as well. That makes a big difference in how you win. Like those those extra eleven points, you could definitely tip your hat to Hofer being in there and playing the way he did. And that gave me a lot of you know. I'm I'm looking forward to next season, seeing what yep. mood, what they decide to do. But I definitely feel super confident about about our goaltending you know, especially thanks to Hofer. Yeah. And for everybody that doesn't know, uh, Hofer played in 30 games for the blues. He had 15 wins, uh, 12 losses, one overtime loss, one shootout. Uh, and his goals against average was 265. And his save percentage was at a 913. And I mean, yeah. frankly, those numbers for a backup goaltender, mind you, a rookie 
backup goaltender, first season in the NHL. I mean, yes, mm-hmm. he com- he complimented Bennington extraordinarily well for his first season in net. And right. I mean, if that's something to tell you for his rookie season, more seasons to come, it's just going to, I feel like just going to get better and better for the young man. So. Um, exactly. Like it's, it's definitely something that we can look at. Yeah. Um, but with that, I will, let's kind of get into some of the other stuff with the uh, press conference. I, I know with, uh, Doug Armstrong, one of the other things that he kind of touched on a lot of was the uh, the coaching. And one thing that he, a lot of the reporters did ask him was, uh, is Drew Bannister going to be uh, in a solidified role with the team? Uh, and Doug more or less came out and said that he – he has a spot or he is put with the way that he uh, came out and coached the team because he came out with a, I think it was a 30, uh, 30, 12 and five record. It was somewhere along those lines. He, it, mm-hmm. it might've been a little more on the losses or I am not probably right on the number, but he had a winning record for the half of the season that he was with the Blues. So that more or less put him into the pool of prospects for the coaching position. Um, mm-hmm. And he – Doug didn't really give any names, which is to be expected just because of it. Why give out any kind of details when you're yourself not even sure of uh, – where everything's going to be because obviously he even said in the conference that there's a few people on the list of names that he has that they're not done playing yet. So, I mean, that's just goes to show you that he's still looking, uh, but Drew could possibly be in the running for that spot as a head coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you got to give Bannister a lot of credit for coming in on the fly and bringing this team close to the playoffs. Just missing out, but he brought uh, stability and he brought, you know, he, you know, players were playing well, he'd sit them. Um, and that that's a good sign of a positive coach. Um, I think a couple of things that caught me uh, when uh, Doug was talking about, um, when he's talking about Bannister, was, yeah, he did give him credit, but one of the questions asked about him was um, not really saying it was a banister that brought this team around, but something along those lines. And Doug really didn't give the credit to banister. He really said, you know, after they got rid of Craig, the team became laser focused. And yep. that was kind of like a, I, I, I didn't take that so much as saying like he's knocking on banister, but to me, that kind of answers a question of Bannister's not really the number one choice. That's why he's a finalist. I feel like yeah. they're looking for something else. Um, I mean, if I want to put my money on it, I would not be surprised if they do whatever they can to bring Jim Montgomery as the head coach here after Boston is out of the playoffs. I can 100% see that. I feel like that's the guy they're talking about. Maybe Sheldon Keith with Toronto because really both of those teams, if they don't, whoever makes it out of the, whoever doesn't make it out of the first round, the coach is gone. Coach will not be coming back. So the answer to that is where, you know, are you going to um, take a step forward and are you going to make a move for one of those coaches? And if it doesn't work out, then, you know, you can always, we do have big minister because he has done an admirable job. But again, I just feel deep in my gut that, Bannister is not Army's first choice, but that doesn't mean it's a bad choice if it goes to him. Right. Yeah, and I I fully 100% agree with you because, I mean, with the way he made it sound, Bannister was more or less like a viable, safe option uh, in case if, like, one of the coaches, yeah, uh, Sheldon Keith, 
uh, Jim Montgomery, possibly even you never know. Rod Brendamore might be on that list because I know that his name was floated around a lot uh, during the regular season. Uh, so, I mean, I, I know Carolina with how they've been playing and everything, that's a possible option. But I mean, like you said, if there, if some of these teams get scooted out of the first round of the playoffs, I know Boston's been, that's happened in the last couple of seasons since Montgomery's taken over as head coach. Uh, Brendan Moore has been kind of, floated around that he could be out with how Carolina has uh, gone and even Toronto with uh, uh, the head coach that they have. I don't can't remember his name. I know I just said him not too shortly ago, but uh, he's, he could be possibly on a chopping block, but I mean, Doug Armstrong did say that the, the list of names went from long to short as this, as the team progressed throughout the regular season and that because of the salt small number of people that are on the list, that's the reason I guess that, uh, well, Drew was among a small number of lists of head coach possibilities for the team coming into next season, more or less. Um, but with that, uh, they said that they, that decision probably wouldn't come until possibly late May or early June, just because of uh, circumstances, which is, I think is about the timetable that is what you said. I don't know if you heard if they had a timetable of that nature or not. You there, James? But, um, so I was wrong with the record that uh, Bannister had. It, it was 30, 19, and 5, not 12 that I said earlier for the losses. Uh, and because of that, he deserved to be in the mix. Um, that he, Doug Armstrong even said that he had a more or less an inner circle of people that he – trusted within the organization that had been kind of going through and as the season's gone along has, that's the reason why that they have been able to dwindle the list and go from a large number of coaching possibilities to a much shorter list. Uh, and with all those in mind, it's going to, I feel like it's going to be a hard choice for uh, Doug. I know there's a couple of targets that he does have in mind. Uh, I don't know if they're totally in the wheelhouse, but they do. They have from 101 ESPN and the other uh, spots, uh, they've thrown around the Denver U University's uh, head coach, uh, David Carl. I know he was uh, – Sounds like he may possibly be an option. Uh, Joe Quinville, even though everything that has been going on with everything that surrounded Chicago and everything else, uh, his name was kind of there, but not really sure just because of everything that could possibly come with negative possible negative publicity with uh Quinville and even if he even is able to come back and coach um in the NHL anytime soon because he still hasn't been cleared uh to even be a head coach yet uh ch -ch 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 -ch. <sighs> some of the things that he was looking for and obviously you got to be able to coach the vast number of veterans and the young guys and that's something that uh doug armstrong has been is looking for and you because we still do have a vast number of veterans on the team we we got a good look at some of the young kids that are coming up and even some of the young kids that are not even up with the team yet and the prospects for the blues 
Um, so with all that in mind, you got to have somebody that's able to coach a lot of guys that have talent in the NHL. And then you got to be able to coach guys that are, haven't quite been there yet and know how to pretty much develop prospects at to become really good players in, 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 in NHL. <laughs> um, but as far as like with the picks and everything that with why they're kind of like, uh, we we're happy, but not happy with what, the outcome was because obviously the blues didn't make it into the playoffs. Um, really the, with the reason why that wasn't, yeah, they uh, got the, I think they locked up the 16th pick for the NHL draft this upcoming season. They, they weren't really all that uh, worried in that aspect is that yet they knew that they had a vast number of good prospects that were coming up uh, through through the vine and everything, but with the draft class that was kind of being presented this season, it seemed like even if they did get a really good high draft number, or even if they didn't, it was going to be kind of short lived because only like, I think the top few uh, draft seeds were going to get fairly good prospects. Um, so <clears throat> that was kind of our take with it. Uh, then with, uh, how, cause I know there was a lot of people that were questioning whether or not, uh, some of the players were going to be coming back or, how everything was going to go with uh, Buchnevich. Some of the, there was a lot of talk that Armstrong has been feeling like there's going to be a contract extension. Uh, but in all honesty, I've been doing, I've even been doing a lot of the thinking with this and you saw how, Butch Nevich, in a way, came out at the start of the season, was playing decent, and then once Bannister kind of took over, it seemed like Bannister was – or not Bannister, <laughs> but Butch Nevich was very kind of streaky just along with some of the other players, and that's something that we haven't really seen from Butch Nevich a lot in the season or two that he's been with the team. Um, so – if there's something that with that, that they may or may not be like, Oh, if we, yes, we have him for the upcoming season because his contract doesn't come up until uh, the following off season. That's something that the, the team may go, hmm, let's see how he plays. Maybe we can get, if we get high enough to where we're in the playoffs next season, maybe we will see, if Buchnevich isn't something that he's uh, not playing to the caliber that we want him, maybe we'll use it as a, a rental. Maybe we'll go along and see what they can do for an extension. Well, that I guess that's something that we'll have to kind of see where uh, everything's going to kind of go with Buchnevich. I personally would like to see him stay in St. Louis. I'm a big fan of him. Obviously, I have – his jersey here, but I, I, it's going to be hard to say. I mean, one player I know that has been kind of talked about a lot uh, in the Blues, and I was even, <laughs> I was even guilty of it for a little bit. Was uh, Jordan Cairo. Uh, and Doug Armstrong even said that there was a very good likelihood that they, he won't be moved in the offseason, which in a way, yeah, I was saying that they could possibly move him. They may not possibly move him. But, I mean, what's to say if they do decide to try to move the guy, then 
it almost be a case to where it's like what they had with Buchnevich during this season at the deadline. We're only going to look for what we want out of the trade for Cairo if we don't get, or sorry, we're looking for two first round pick equivalent players for Buchnevich. And if we're not going to, we're not going to step down from that. This is what we want out of this player. If we don't get that, then we're not going to move on from him. I would say that would be a very good kind of take to take with Cairo this off season going into next season and even off the next off season, because after next off season is when his uh, no trade clause kicks into effect so, I mean, you have one whole offseason to try to move him and even next season to see uh, how he plays. And you may get more trade capital from Cairo, seeing how he plays next season. So, it all, I would say, if that's something that Doug is looking to, that I would say sticks to his guns just like he did with Buchnevich. Um James, you doing good or how are you doing over there, bud? <laughs> <laughs> Still having a little bit of troubles, it seems like, but um, so for the outlook, it's outlook of the team from what uh, Armstrong was saying that he he didn't really honestly give a whole lot of input on uh, the long-term outlook just because it's too, I would say it's too early to really tell. Uh, he did mention that there was some players on the team that he was looking to possibly uh, do something with. He wouldn't give any names just like he wouldn't give any names with coaches, um, but got a long off season uh, and we all expect that there's going to be some kind of moves uh, with the team. Not exactly sure who it's going to be. There's a there's a little bit of a tell that he is going to kind of do something with the defense. Um, but yet again, there was no real uh, kind of names given. Uh, so we'll have to kind of see what kind of goes from there. And uh, David, thank you for coming out and joining us from all the way from Cedar Hill, Texas, man. That is awesome. Glad to hear, see you coming out and watching the show. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's always, there's always going to be some kind of room to deal with the team because I mean, this, this off season, you're going to see a drastic uh, increase in the salary cap. You doing good there, bud? I'm trying. <laughs> I'm here. I promise. I touched that thing. I don't know. What oh, I know. I know. Uh, you're having I'm... you're having the issues that I've had numerous of times whenever we've tried to do this. And... <laughs> uh, it seems like every time it's only either um, you I... or most of the time it's me having the issue. This time it's an odd thing to where you're actually having the issue this time. <laughs> Yeah, for some reason, my connection just decides to, you know, get drunk, I guess. I don't know. Um, really, like, the bits and pieces I caught, um, I know you're definitely right. There's There needs to be improvement in the forwards. Now, whether yep. you do trade Rich, that's hard to say, or Cairo, I don't know. Um, I think there – I think what needs to happen is definitely we need um, – we definitely need a front net presence, not just neighbors and not even a front net presence, but we need guys who have the edge on them. You know, yeah. um, Braden Shen's gotten too old to do that. We can't expect him to keep throwing his body out there trying to fight people. And neighbors has stepped up some in that aspect, but not, not a lot. We need more, more guys like that we need. need Just 
Oh, you might be having issues again. Uh, but kind of touching what he was saying that, yeah, you need, need guys like neighbors that have started kind of, uh, that need to kind of be in that world that not just having solely to rely on, on Shen. Uh, Cause I know Braden Shen, he's been really good about being a, that guy that's always looking out for the team uh, has always been like that guy that's going to get gritty with anybody that kind of gets in and so. does anything to the team. But you have, I mean, this year we've had, yeah, I think you're back. I don't know if we're back or not. Well, I'm going to keep talking until I get. <laughs> oh boy. Um, uh, but yeah, you have neighbors, uh, you've had a little bit of Jordan Wa- or not Jordan. Wow. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of baseball at the moment. Uh, God, you had Walker who has also been, uh, kind of getting a little bit gritty, but a lot of the thing that the team is needing aside from just guys that are getting up at the plate up in up in the blue paint, you need guys that are willing to get in the middle of the ice and not just be perimeter style players that like some of the players on the blues are. And so with that, it's been, it's been hard because you only get at some, at times those guys that play along the perimeter and everything. And I think that's, if you get a good mix of those guys like neighbors and, uh, Walker, who do that a lot, and you've even kind of saw that a little bit from uh, Bolduc uh, towards the few games that he actually played. You saw that a lot as well. Uh, and then uh, Dean, he didn't really have a whole lot of time to really show that, but you could kind of see a little bit of it. So it's it'll be interesting to kind of see where they go with all the different players and all the contracts, because the one thing that I really found that was uh, surprising or shocking out of the uh, press conference that Doug Armstrong had was the fact that he said that if there was a possibility of buying out contracts for players that haven't really came into the fold of what the blues are wanting to do that Doug said that he would be willing to possibly consider it, which I mean, over the years, I don't think I've ever seen or heard Armstrong say that he would willing to DFA a player on his team. Uh, It's just never been something that Armstrong was known to do. So it's, it'll be interesting to kind of see what happens with that because I know there was several times during the season that uh, Kairu got benched. Uh, towards the end of the season, there was times where Kevin Hayes got benched. Uh, Robert Thomas got benched a couple of games. But, I, I again, Thomas – and maybe possibly Cairo, those are possibly players that we don't see get moved or DFA'd just because of the impact that they have on the team. I'm just saying that there's possibly contracts within the Blues that haven't uh, really demonstrated that they've – not the player that they were once were, and if the – if they're not able to trade them or whatever the case is, and they need to move on to something better that the blues will, or that Armstrong will do the necessary steps. If something is readily available to put onto the team if, and DFA, whatever contract needs to be getting rid of uh, those were kind of a lot of the things that they touched on. Uh, during the press conference. Uh, and yes, David, we cannot wait. I, I'll be definitely watching the uh, the Battlehawks game on Saturday. It's 
they've been doing really well, and they'll be. I know they'll have a lot of people in attendance for the game, um, but yeah. Uh, if there's anything else, uh, please put in the comments uh, for whenever we have our next show. Uh, we'll definitely try to bring it up on the next uh, episode of the Three One Four Show when it, we air on. Wednesday next week. I know we have the five hole on Mondays. Uh, we'll be kind of doing that as well for that. It'll be more total NHL and probably running through all the playoff stuff uh, for the show on Monday and possibly even the show for a 314 show on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be kind of going a little bit of playoff stuff, probably touching on more blue stuff as the weeks kind of go with these shows since the blues are out of the playoffs. Um, so we'll, we'll keep you guys informed of what's going on with the playoffs and even with the blues. So uh, thank you guys all for coming out for today's episode. And I'm very sorry that James wasn't able to be in here for the entire uh, show tonight. He's having some technical difficulties, but I do greatly Appreciate you guys all tuning in for this long into the video if you've all stayed. So until next time, thank you, and we'll see you later. Peace.